One of the continent's best studied songbirds, the lovely white-throated sparrow belongs to the New World Sparrow family Passerellidae, and is not to be confused with the house sparrow because unlike the latter, this charming character people are quite fond of. Measuring roughly 7 inches in length, these large, full-bodied sparrows have a rounded head and somewhat prominent bill. The back is streaked, a coloration common in sparrows, and they have a clear gray underbody. A few distinctive features are the bright yellow eyelores, noticeable throat patch, and bold pattern head. An interesting thing is that this coloration on the crown comes in two morphs, tan striped and white striped. The white version has black and white stripes and the tan version has tan and black head stripes. Often people assume that white morphs are males and tan morphs are females. If only that were the case, it would be much easier. There are female and male tan versions and vice versa. I have read though that female birds, whether a tan or white striped crown, tend to be duller in color. Juvenile and fledgling birds have a washed color and are more streaky. This appearance lasts through the first year, making it fairly easy to tell who the young white-throated sparrows are. Over winter, most of the population inhabit the eastern and southern U.S where it is a common and welcome backyard visitor. Come spring though, between mid-April to early June, the majority of these likable sparrows arrive back to the remote boreal woodlands of Canada to breed, as well as several areas of the northeastern United States. It has been estimated by Boreal Songbird Initiative that a whopping 83% of the population breeds within the boreal forest. One fact I've always found fascinating is something researchers have discovered how they return to the exact breeding location from the year before. I have witnessed this myself back in 2013 when the first white-throated sparrow I ever had trust me, named Whitey, returned for his second year in the precise spot he occupied in 2012, the first year I met him. Since then, I've noticed that with many of the other sparrows I've come to know over the years. Good boy. One fun observation I've made is that each of the white-throated sparrows that have come to trust me, around a dozen or more, not only remember their precise breeding area, but me too. While walking along my normal wooded area, these little guys pop out to chase me, trying to get my attention so that I give them a peanut. This has been occurring out here in the forest I frequent since 2012, but really became common after 2015. So every spring I look forward to seeing the many sparrows that have come to see me as a friend they can trust. In summer, look for them in woodlands at the forest edge, openings with low dense vegetation as well, or areas regrowing after logging, fires, or insect damage. A few other habitats they like are edges of ponds, meadows, and bogs. During migration in winter, you'll find them along edges of woodlots, weedy fields, backyards, and city parks. Over spring, they eat a variety of tree buds and flowers, such as oak, apple, maple, and beech. A large number of insects and other arthropods are consumed during summer. Overall, the diet is about 20% animal and 80% vegetable. When foraging, it can be seen on the ground near cover where they scratch in the leaf litter to uncover insects. You can also find them in small bushes and lower sections of coniferous trees, gleaning insects or buds from stems and leaves. Since they do visit backyards outside of the breeding season, it is possible to attract them to bird feeders by providing sunflower seeds, millet, or loose peanuts. They are more often seen foraging on the ground below, eating the fallen seeds. When moving around, they hop rather than walking or running. As I mentioned earlier, there are two color morphs, tan and white striped, and interestingly, they behave differently from one another. White striped birds, whether male or female, tend to be more aggressive than the tan version. As most of you already know, spring is a time when birds look for a mate and defend territory by singing. These guys work pretty hard, singing well into the wee hours of morning, which leaves them a little sleepy during the day. When it comes to choosing a partner, individuals mate with a bird of the opposite morph most of the time, which is why the two forms remain. 
Studies have shown that males of both versions prefer females with white stripes, but for the opposite sex, both kinds of females favor tan striped males. White-throated sparrows don't mate for life, but a pair stays together for the summer. Come next year, though, they choose new partners. Female white-throated sparrows build a nest on or just above the ground, usually under shrubs, grasses, or ferns. Incubation period lasts for around 11 to 14 days. When nestlings hatch, they are featherless except for some patches on the head, back, and wings. Eyes are closed. 7 to 12 days after hatching, they fledge and are fed by their parents for an additional two weeks. Probably one of the most striking things about white-throated sparrows is their song, a very well-known tune. In fact, they are so widespread and common in Canada's boreal forest during summer that their notorious song is almost like the anthem for the beautiful, unspoiled wilderness, as Boreal Songbird Initiative put it. Many see its sweet, distinctive whistle as being synonymous with the northern wilderness. Although most songbirds don't sing much over winter, that doesn't seem to be the case for the white-throated sparrow, which means that although they don't breed in most of the United States, many American birders still get to hear their lovely tune. The sweet melody contains two longer notes, followed by a rhythmic three-syllable phrase, described mnemonically by people in the U.S. as Old Sam Peabody Peabody Peabody, and as Oh Sweet Canada 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 by Canadians. I should also mention that something pretty neat about their song has been occurring for the last 20 years. Instead of ending off with a series of three-syllable phrases, a growing number of sparrows are using a version that ends with a series of two-syllable phrases sounding more like Oh sweet canna canna canna. The new type originated in Western Canada prior to the year 2000 and spread very quickly from British Columbia to Ontario in just two decades. Now the old song, the three-syllable tune, is only heard in far eastern populations. To learn more about this, I'll leave a link down below. There are a few other calls these birds make too, such as the pink. This one has a somewhat piercing loud sound and is used as an alarm by an agitated bird when a predator or some kind of threat is detected. Another call is the seat, which is used in a way to locate their mate or keep in contact with one another while foraging. There are other calls too, but I don't have recordings of them, such as trills used during the breeding season by females, or the chip up, one used by males or females when arriving at the nest with food. The white-throated sparrow seems to be doing well and is pretty abundant, with a breeding population of roughly 140 million. The majority spends half the year in the U.S. and then the other half of the year in Canada. A very small percentage migrate as far as Mexico for the winter. Remarkably, the oldest recorded white-throated sparrow was at least 14 years, 11 months old when it was recaptured and re-released during banding operations in Alberta. So that's a little about these delightful sparrows. They have always been a favorite of mine. I love how they are woodsy birds primarily, but also visit backyards occasionally, most notably over winter. For a sparrow, they have some pretty vibrant and bold coloration, and it's always been interesting to me about the two morphs, especially the fact that the two seem to almost always mate together. Of course, their song is a treat to hear, and for me personally, it takes me way back to when I was a little girl, probably around seven years old, playing outside in the open field with my friends on warm summer evenings. My very first encounter with that song, but not knowing who the culprit was and never having that encounter again until 2011 when I took up my birding hobby as an adult. Finally, the mystery was solved. I now knew who was behind the song that had stopped my seven-year-old self in her tracks. It makes me giddy just thinking about how things unfolded. I never imagined that I'd actually become friends with the mystery singer. 
Of everything I went over about these darling birds, what did you like learning about? And did I leave out anything? Comment below and let me know. As always, I hope you enjoyed this video. Thanks a lot for watching. Take care. Happy birding.